So how is it going with the assignment? Is that good? I will be also interested if you guys have been trying the exercises that you let me know, in particular this uh, sort of classification that uh, I put at the top, like medium, basic or, or uh, more difficult ones, um, if it matches your expectation or not. Um, just to know how, how far I am from, from <laughs> what I think is uh, with respect to what you, what you perceive from the exercises. So it looks like uh, it's all it's all clear. Okay, do the same. Okay, perfect, Richard. Great. Um, yeah, uh, as I say, let me know if there are any questions. Uh, the forum has been quite active, and some of you have been posting very specific questions. So that's that's really good. Um, but if there is anything that is not clear in particular, please let me know. So we're going to start. And the recording. Um, so this is our lecture number seven. Let me share my screen. So hopefully by now you should be able to see my desktop. As usual, there are a lot of things going on here, and I think I have one more person to meet. There we go. Okay. Uh, um, okay, so let's start the lecture today. There is a lot of material here. Uh, I don't think we will be able to cover everything today, uh, but it's good stuff. So we're going to probably, if we don't have enough time, go over whatever is left uh, on next class. Let me see if I can... Uh, All right. So the plan for today uh, is to talk about file input and output. And there is, there is something meaning with that, like what, what do I really mean with that? Well, this is a little bit of, of um, the details that we're going to discuss today. So we're going to talk about what is the basic file inputs and output in R. And by, by the way, usually it's referred as I.O., input and output, so reading and saving data. A little bit of the file system theory, not too much actually, but this is the crucial part. The different ways that you have to save data, basically text versus binary raw data or binary structured data. So this is where we're going to be focusing today. And this somehow, um, I will strongly say, follows so one of the best practices that we discussed uh, last week. So. It's not directly best practices apply for programming, but it's best practice apply for implementing um, solutions for your problems. So this is what we're going to be talking today. Very quickly, you are familiar with this by now. I just want to give you the formal names of the formal definitions. So imagine that you have a sequence or series of directories or folders. So if you are in a Windows machine, people just refer to them usually as folders. If you are in a Linux or Mac OS, they refer as as directories, but they are the same thing. Uh, and, the, and the idea is here is how to categorize, how you basically save your data in different compartments, different folders, so you keep things organized. So I may have a folder one, and within folder one I may have another folder called hello, and within there a couple of files, or even within folder one I may have a file called word.txt, or I may have a second folder, folder two, with a file called node.txt. So this sequence, folder one word txt or folder two node txt or for the one hello etc., is usually referred as the as the path, the path that you need to follow to find a particular file or a particular location in your computer. And this is the way that we usually organize ourselves, right? In your desktop, you may have a few. I have a few files. Uh, just laying there, not, not the most organized thing, but then I may have a folder for this course and other courses and, and so on. So the way to find those things, to find um, my way through the computer and through those files, is to follow this particular path. Okay? We have seen some of these functions already. Some are new. Get working directory is tell you basically in which location are you 
place located at this moment. And usually I spend way more time when I also have my, my Linux shell introduction in, in, in a course like this, but this, in this case we didn't have, but basically get what team directory tells you where basically the R is going to be looking for files that you source or you want to load directly from them. Now related to that, I think we saw this one, dir create creates a folder or a directory. Uh, but there is also directsys, very similar to the file exist function that you may be trying to use for your assignment, for the extra bonus mark in the assignment. Set working directory, we saw that one, I strongly, strongly suggest to do not include this one in your scripts because it made them fail if that particular directory does not exist in other computers. Uh, dir, you are going to be using this one for the assignment and a similar one is list files so these two are very similar actually this also shows if there are subdirectories within the particular directory that you are looking at okay now one thing that you may notice is this gives you the whole path to the place where you are located right so that is interesting to know and that may now um, be more consistent or be more clear when you do get working directory why R is giving you all that. Now, related to file specific functions, as I was mentioning, there is the file exists and you use a file name and then it will tell you it's true or not if the file exists. So, again, something related to um, what you will be doing today, uh, sorry, not today for this assignment, for this week assignment. File path give you the location of uh, the file, including the file name. Okay, and this name tells you in which directory that file is located. Now, these things, and I'm not going to go into much detail, file path and their name give you what they are called the relative path, meaning that if I'm located in that directory right now and that file exists there, it just outputs the file name. Their name, same thing, the dot means the current directory. If I want the whole path, if I want the whole transversation of the location of my um, file, I had to use normalized path. So that's another another function. Again, I keep I, I, I show you this one is because mostly uh, just to, to manage access to files and, and, and file properties and anything else. Okay. So a couple of functions, some of them we have seen, some of them we may not use in the course, but it's always a good idea to, to keep those in mind. Okay, so let's start with saving things into files. So we have seen read.csv, for instance, that function for reading data. So how can I save data into a text file? And all of us, we are familiar with text files, in particular the scripts that you're writing are text files. So how we save that? Okay, the function you may want to use is file. So that function basically creates a file. You give the name of the file, output.txt, and then you say in which mode you want to open the file. W stands for writing, so this is going to allow you, when you open the file, to write, to save data into this file. You can use R, basically, to read data, or if the file already exists and you want to add data, you use A for a pair. Okay? So the other thing is, when I do this, I assign this to a variable, F, this is usually known as the handler of the file, so it's a reference to the file itself. And then I can say write lines, whatever I want to write. Remember, this is text, so we're going to be writing just words, text, into the file. Okay. Similarly, I write hello, I write word into the file. F. So I can repeat this as many times as I want. This point is super important. After you are done writing things into the file, you need to close the file. Okay? If you do not close the file, that file may be corrupted and you won't be able to recover the information. So this is what opens or creates the file, where you write the, the file and then how you close the file. And for all the formats that we're going to see today, more or less, this is the pattern you will follow. Okay? Uh, alternately, I can just say in one line, write file outputs and the text, okay? Or if I want to add something, I can say write file output text for an append equal true. And there is one more way, remember our old friend the cat function, well cat function can also redirect the output into a text file. You can say cat hello to file 
output of txt and say append equal true and that will keep adding things into the file okay so this is how you will write information into a text file okay of course if you want to save a whole data frame let's say instead of using write you will be using write.csv similarly to read.csv or write table so write table and write csv are, are similar functions similar to read csv and write table what a table allows you to do is to have a more rich structure but they are very very similar actually one call each other so uh, they are kind of the same thing a question uh, yes so when you when you edit a file you will also need to close it it depends how you do it right if I use for instance cat uh, in this way I, I believe cat will close it for you but if you open with a here instead of W and you write something then you want to close it okay so anytime that you don't do the direct output in the line either with write or with cut then you will need to close the file okay in write csv or write table for instance because we do write.csv data frame file equal the name of the file where we want to save things you don't need to close it okay but otherwise you will need to close it. okay that's a really good question okay. There is another way, and this is an alternative way, and, and this one can be useful sometimes. This is for thinking uh, the output from the console. And this can be useful sometimes when you are prototyping, prototyping things and you are exploring data and you don't want to lose the history. So we saw the history command a couple of lectures ago or a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, so sync allow you to redirect the output from the terminal into a file. Uh, so the way it works is you do sync and the file name where you want to start syncing <laughs> it's a funny name I found uh, the output of the terminal so for instance I'm typing tuplify here db7 so now if I do sync output 2.txt then I do I type my commands now one thing you notice is when you start typing commands in a sync session or in a synced session uh, they won't print in the screen okay they will go the output will go directly into the file okay so you can see nothing of this is printing the skin in, in the screen sorry so now you do sync null and that brings back the output to the terminal okay so if i if i uh, type 2 plus 5 now it gives me 7 then i quit and if i do cut is a way to show um, the file in in the terminal in the in the shell so you don't need to worry but if you look inside the file you will see basically this okay the, the output of what it was printed now there is a way to have the output printed in the screen and uh, redirected to the file as well so you need to use a split equal true so you will do sync output 2.txt comma split equal to and in that way you will see also in the screen whatever is saved in the file and again, this could be useful, especially if you are exploring new data, if you are prototyping some things, and you don't want to lose either the output or, or the commands that you have been uh, uh, using. Okay? By the way, out, uh, the sync only says the output. It doesn't say the commands. So if you want the commands themselves, you will have to do history at some point here, and that will basically give you the whole, the whole uh, sequence of commands that you have used. Again, it can be useful or not. I have used it some couple of times. If, for instance, if I had a function that does a, a report in the screen, I, I tell you where I found the use. For instance, if I, I have a function that reports something in the screen, they say, uh, like, what you will be doing in assignment in assignment three this week, and then I want to add an option uh, to this function to say the output of this uh, of this function to a file. Well, basically, I just put a flag saying save to file, and if it is true, then I start my, my function with a sync command, and then I close my sync at the end, and in that way, I can offer the user to see the output in the screen or in, in a file. That's, that's one application I, I, I found for sync for instance. Okay. Let's see, I think we have another question from uh, Laura. Do the files uh, already exist when they are written to? Um, so good question so 
if it doesn't exist it creates a new one so in this case it, it doesn't exist I don't uh, it's a good question I don't remember if sync will I think sync will keep appending I, I had to double check this this is a good question I think sync will keep appending to an existing file but don't take um, don't take my word for it okay okay uh, good question Jennifer so this is uh, again this this tilde thing represents the shell so it's not a command so when I do quit here I'm out of the R session and what that represents is if I were in a terminal like in macOS or in Ubuntu or in Linux or the command line terminal in Windows so this is a way to actually just look at whatever was saved in the file alternately you can just go to your browser to the file explorer and open that text file and that's what you will see the, the, the output of what I print in the screen so don't know, don't worry about that that's that's just me showing how to do it in in a shell session but not in R. alternately now you can do something like um i think there is a function show file or display file that will basically do the same okay, okay. Keep, keep asking questions guys okay that's that's really good so that's our scene command let me tell you so that we saw how to save files uh, in text how we read them well there is a couple of ways one is to use the read lines function um, basically it, it reads the entire content of the file at once um, if you want to read one line by uh, at the time you can use n equal one um, so again we need to assign we need to tell uh, which is the file that we want to uh, look at so this is the file that we were syncing before, so file output 2.txt I'm going to assign it to a variable f and then read lines f and it shows me all the lines so it shows me line 1, hello, line 2, do a bunch of stuff, line 3 and it says, I shows as a strings and it says also the bracket 1, right? so that's something that it could be annoying because that's, that's something that the print function you probably have discovered that likes to put these bracket ones to uh, enumerate these things Alternatively, and you can do this, so if I read lines f, now I, I'm going to read lines uh, of the file again by assigning to a variable, and I look at the structure, uh, you can see this, this is basically a list of strings. Okay? So instead of just dumping it on the screen, you may want to assign to a variable and then post-process that. And in this, uh, the same thing applies when we open a file, in this case it's open for reading, we need to close it. Okay? So same idea, um, there are a couple of different functions you can use, you can also use, as I was mentioning, read CSV, read table, read the lim is, a, is another one from this family of functions, the good thing of all of them is they are kind of the same function and you can define your own delimiter, so you can say for instance my delimiter here is uh, quotation mark bracket one and then quotation mark and that will say okay each of these are different columns or different rows in my file so you can define the structure of the file and in that way you can use even a, one of these functions for reading text files and then you will have more as a data frame format than text will be useful or not depends on what you really want to do with, with the file but this is the way to uh, basically bring back the data that we saved before okay Okay, so some of you, some of you, very, very uh, interestingly, have run into this. So when you were using DIR for, or, or you are using DIR for looking into the files uh, placed in a particular directory, I told you there's, uh, to use help on DIR, and there is this option pattern. So pattern basically allows you to specify what type of files you want to look at. Now, if you look at the help patterns, is is specified by something called regular expressions. And regular expressions are quite complicated, to be honest, and I'm not planning to cover them here. But there is this super useful function, which is global to regular expression. And basically what I allow you to do is to write things like a star, which represents anything. So basically this thing, star.txt, means all the files that end in .txt. You may have seen that pattern equal quotation mark txt or pattern 
equal uh, quotation mark star docs TST will work in the same manner. But if you want to do things more complicated, like having all the files that has a O in the first character, a T in the third character, and in TXT, you will need some sort of districts. I mentioning this just as, a, as a something more general. For the assignment, again, you are fine with just pattern equal CSV or pattern equal star CSV or dot star, uh, star dot CSV. Either of those work. I just wanted to, to disclose this because if you are trying to do something more, more uh, there were a couple of good questions in the forum and by email asking about this. So I wanted to, to disclose this. If you want to do something more genetic, you may want to look at this function uh, and, and patterns, how you write this, or you can just write directly the regular expression patterns. But as I say, it's, it's usually complicated. Okay, I think the other question. What is the Y card? Perfect. So the Y card means anything. So in this case, I have three files in my in my directory, and the Y card or, or the star in this case that's that's the Y card means much anything that is in front of .txt. So if I have another file called hello.txt, it will also show up as my list of txt files. Now I can say with this glob2 regular expression function, I can say o star.txt and then it will only show my output to .txt files instead of the hello file. So basically the, the Y card, this star thing, this asterisk character represents anything. So it matches any pattern that is any any name that is in front of .txt. Okay. Again, it's, it's a very useful thing uh, in Unix. So this comes from from Linux Unix style um, uh, tricks, if you wish. But it's very useful and very powerful. Okay. So I just want you to have a flavor, a, a, um, a taste of this. Uh, and if you want to learn more. Of course, you, you can ask me or I can redirect you to some useful resources. Okay, but it's very, very powerful. Okay, now this is quite important. And it, the example will look artificial to you, but I believe me, this I have seen many times, and this slows down your code terribly. And in particular, if you're running a supercomputer, this will probably not break the file system, but make it very, very slow for everyone else running on the same supercomputer. So let's take a look at this. This is a string, hello world, okay? I'm going to use this function, and this is where the artificial part come into place, okay? This function is called str split, so it's basically a string split. I'm going to pass my string into the function, and it's going to break by using, uh, so this is single quotation mark, single quotation mark. And, in, and the bracket bracket one means the first output of this of this function. It will basically break in each letter the function. So this is a way to basically um, spell the function if you <laughs> spell the string if you wish. So it will take the string and it will give you back each letter in a list. Okay. So hello world gives me all the letters composing the sentence hello world. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use our old friend the for loop. A looping variable i, i is going to take each of the values of these characters. Okay, so I'm taking just exactly the same command I run here, so it gives me the list of characters. And then what I'm going to do, and this is the, the very bizarre artificial part again, is I'm going to open the word, the file uh, high word txt for appending, and I'm going to cut into the file uh, each of the characters, and then I'm going to close it. Okay. So what happened? And then I'm going to say uh, a new line at the end and append to the file. Okay. So what will happen here is the file is going to be open. It's going to write one character. It's going to be closed. And this is going to be repeated for, the, for each character in the sentence. And you will say, why on earth you would want to do that? Well, it's just to show you how to don't do things. So this is the bad way of doing things. And again, this may sound artificial because we already have the whole sentence here. But I can stop, and I think this is a clear example why you won't do it. You have to break the sentence into part. But now think about like you are performing a series of computations like you are doing in the assignment three. Um, and instead of saving the whole output at the end of the processing, you are saving at each stage. So that's the analogous of this. So the, the take home message is this is the right way of doing it. You have the whole information at some point, open the file once, 
save whatever is the information, close the file, and you're done, right? Here is repeated for as many characters as we have there. Imagine this is, again, this is a loop uh, inside a, a, a data frame or a series of files. Then if this is a million of files, and some of you may have at some point to deal with large amount of data, this is a really bad strategy for saving the data, okay? So this is just, again, it's a quite artificial example to show you, but it's a really good example, I think, to, to um, display, to show, to contrast these two ways of saving things. Try to save whenever it's possible, of course, this is a, a kind of ideal case as well, because everything will fit in memory, so you can keep everything in memory and they save after all the post-processing things from memory into the file, okay? Uh, alternatively, I would say, if fits in memory, do all your analysis and then save things into the file. Okay. Again, this will come back, especially we're not going to do very, very um, uh, big data analysis in this course, uh, but at some point if you find yourself processing a lot of, of data, depends on which field you are, right? But if you're doing genetics, this may show up, you may see programs or pipelines in bioinformatics doing these kind of things, and this again, Sometimes it will run just fine in your computer because you may have a solid state device, but when you need to move into a cluster type environment where hard drives are the old fashioned in most of the cases, this may start to show um, to be a bottleneck because one of the things that we are going to be learning today is file IO, reading and writing data is always, always the slowest part in any computational pipeline, in any program that you will run because the part that is involved is the hardware, is, the, is where the data is going to be saved, and that is the slowest part in your computer. Okay, so that's why I wanted to show you this example. Again, it may find, or it may sound artificial, but at some point you may find yourself doing some kind of version of this. So just wanted to be clear about that, okay? So these are some, some suggestions for improving your input-output profiling operations. So it's important that you minimize the file input output as much as possible. As I mentioned, this input output is always the slowest part in any analysis, in any program. Um, so if that is the case that you have to do, you want to try to minimize operations. Uh, how you can try to do? Well, you can load everything into memory. Of course, assuming that you have enough memory in the computer, you can reuse data. So don't read data from your files. Uh, so try to use, so this is a technique especially available in, in Linux operating systems. You can try, again, if you have enough memory, you can try to save things into what we call RAM disk. RAM disk is a piece of the memory that behaves as a disk. And again, this is a super useful and very, very flexible technique. Um, keep results in memory and write once at the end when you're done. And this is the next part that we're going to be covered today. Instead of saving things in text, save it in binary formats. And binary format is the actual language that the computer speaks. So R is a way to communicate for us to the computer, but inside the computer, in the microprocessor, the computer understands and manages everything at the level of, of binary. So that is probably your best bet when you need to save large amount of data. Okay? If we have any questions, looks like this is clear right now. Uh, so for, for understanding a little bit more about this, let's take a look and see or describe what is inside a file. So we have different formats of files. Text files, like the scripts that we have seen or the output that we have seen or even the CSP files from the TTC data that you are working with right now. Uh, they basically seems very attractive because you can just open the file and look at it, right? You can see the data right away. Uh, although it's not as trivial as it sounds, and we're going to see this in, in a second. So the idea here is that in each file there is information, and that information has to be encoded, has to be assigned to a particular letter or symbol, and that's what we see in the script. Uh, ideally, there are unique assignments across languages. It's not the same if I'm writing a text file in plain English or in Arabic or even in, in French, right? There are extra characters in the, in the French alphabet. So 
I have at the end, so I, I usually have that in this session, but this, this series of, of slides is, is quite long already. So I have at the end, after the summary slide, uh, a, a couple of slides about encoding. So if you need to do some particular encoding in languages, you can see how to do that in R. But that's something to bear in mind. The binary format, on the other hand, uh, this basically corresponds to save the data in the same way that the computer keeps the data in memory. And this is, this is tremendously efficient because it's fast. In particular, when you are saving numerical values, there is a conversion because your numerical values, remember the difference between the different type of variables. You had integral variables, uh, double variables, or real variables, numbers with a float, with a decimal point. When we say those, those numbers, the computer actually has to convert those numbers into strings and then save as a string. So there is a two-step already um, increment there in, in performances. So there is one extra goodie from binary formats, and we're going to see this one by the end of the lecture or by the end of the slides. I don't know if it's going to be today or the next class, that in many file formats, you can also include data about the data that you are saving. And that is crucial. Nowadays, it's a must in any research field, um, this is usually known as metadata, and basically it de describes what features, what characteristics of your data, or how your data was generated. Okay, we are going to see. So, good examples of this are the HDF uh, file format or NetCDF file format. We are going to, in particular, see this last one, NetCDF. Okay, these are called self-describing uh, binary formats. Okay. So two flavors of files, basically, text or binary. Um, so just to give you an idea of the text format, so basically this goes by the American Standard Code Information uh, Interchange Encoding. You use seven bits for creating one character, for, for basically representing one character. If you do the computation two to the seven, give you 128 possibilities, but there are only 95 printable characters. The others are special codes that the computer uses for something else. Um, basically, this is the, the so if you if you want to use integers, these are the, the, the characters that you will use, and, and the alphabet is encoded right here. So these are the different values that represent the integers in ASCII. Okay? Bottom line of this is whenever this happens, the, there are several steps. Um, to, to represent this. And the comparison here is you need 18 bytes versus 8 bytes that you will use in binary. So it's inefficient because you use more memory. The conversion also takes time, so it's going to be slower than handling things in binary. And again, if you are dealing with floating point numbers, numbers that are not integers, uh, there is no exact representation. So you have a loss of precision there. Okay. So those are caveats to bear in mind when we're using ASCII representation or text format representation. The binary format, uh, as I say, the, the output is in storage uh, in the same format in which uh, the computer accesses it in memory. And the question is why bothering, especially if I can so the, 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 the downside here is if I have a binary file and I want to access it, well, I cannot directly just go with the browser and double click on the file because the computer will not know how to display that, okay? Uh, or the, or the, not the computer, let me, let me fix that, is it's the actual browser doesn't know how to display that. Um, well, this is the reason. So I'm showing you the performance in, in a file system, in a supercomputer, like in Synet, and in RAM this using this piece of memory. So if you say in file, in text, so that's what they ask it, it takes 128 megabytes, that's, that's basically 128 million doubles numbers, uh, so it's 128 million decimal point numbers, if you wish. Uh, in ASCII it takes 173 seconds, even if I use memory, in binary it takes 6 seconds or 1 second. Okay, so the speed up is two orders of magnitude, and that's and that's, that's what we are talking about. Now, again, we are talking order of seconds. So, well, I can I can wait three minutes for say, right? Well, it, it, believe me, one thing is to have the file open in six seconds and read in six seconds, and the other is to be three minutes staring at the computer. So that's that's the kind of difference that we are talking about. The disadvantage is not human readable. 
Like you won't be able, unless you are some kind of Neo in the matrix, you won't be able to see the binary code and understand it. But believe me, when you have something of the order of 128 million numbers, you may be able to see them and don't make sense of them unless you visualize them in some manner. So that part is not such a, a, a big thing when you are talking about large amount of data, okay? So that's kind of the, the contrast, the, the comparison between the text format and the binary format, okay? And again, um, this is another, another thing that you need to bear in mind. Uh, there are different ways we can say binary data. And one way is what we call raw binary data. So what that means is I take whatever is in the memory of the computer and I save it in a file in the language that the computer can speak. Not us, so we won't be able to see that, but we just take instructions of the computer know them. Turns out these are just zeros and ones, sequence of zeros and ones. It's like the DNA of the computer, if you wish, DNA code of the computer, zeros and ones. That's how the computer interprets things. And, and you just save it. Now, this is, this is a little bit tricky. And let me put you an example. Let's suppose that we have a matrix of 100 by 100 elements with floating point numbers, with numbers that has a decimal point. So we have 100 by 100. This basically will give you a 40,000 bytes file. Now, when I, so I say that, when I want to read this again, and I don't know that this was saved from a matrix of 100 by 100 elements, that basically gives me, okay, I'm not sure if this is, a, the, the information comes from a matrix of 100 by 100, if this is actually one vector of 10, 000, uh, sorry, 10,000 elements, or this is a string with 40,000 characters, or maybe something else. So that is one of the disadvantages of saving the data as raw binary data. We don't save information about the structure, the, the variable that was containing that information. Okay? Hope that makes sense. If not, please let me know. I'm happy to try to clarify as much as I can. Okay? But that is one of the downsides of raw binary data. And that, what takes me, is to binary formats. So instead of saving the data as just raw binary data, we can save the data as binaries with a particular structure underlying that. Luckily for us, R already has a couple of these. So R data is an R specific format. It cannot be read by any other languages, though. So whatever you, sh you save as an R data, file is going to be binary, so that's good in comparison to text files, but it can only be accessed by R. Okay? RDS is another R-specific format. It stores a single R object for file, so maybe it's not as, as flexible as this, but still it's binary and, and it can be read by R. Now, these other two here, these are like the cream of the cream, because these are self-describing binary formats, um, NCDF is, is oriented to array data type of structure, so vectors and matrices. HDFI is way more general than that. So it has the same features as NCDF, uh, but it's also more generic. It's kind of saving data in, in a file format, so you, will you are able to have folders and directories and different type of files all containing say an HD file. So it stands for hierarchical, hierarchical data format. Now these two, these two are, are like considered the, the professional type of data interchange or exchange because it can be read from different architectures, it can be read from different languages. I can say an HCD file uh, in R and someone in Python will be able to read it or someone using C or C++ or any other thing. And they have what we call APIs, uh, accessible programmable interfaces and tools that you can actually access the data within anything else. Okay? So these ones are, are if you are developing a, a, you know, a, a software that you want to share within the community and make it like professional looking, those that's, that's are the formats that you may be targeting. Okay? They are not so hard to implement, and we're going to see, for instance, how to do that with NetCDF. Okay? 
So let's take a, a, a dive very quickly through the other file formats as well. So let's look at the R data type. And again, if you want to do something quickly, and again, instead of saving things in text file, you will see you can do it in, in R uh, binary raw data. So uh, instead of saving just uh, with, with write, uh, you use save. Okay, the save function and the load function. So let's say we have two variables, 10 and hello. So these two different types of variables, a number and a string, and I want to save both. So I say bar one, bar two, and then I specify the name of where I save my things. Okay, the file name. In this case, my data.r data. I exit R, I come back, and then I load, use load, the name of, of my data file, and that's it. Then variable one and variable two are available in my session. Okay, super easy, super simple. You just need to specify the list of variables you want to save and the name of the file. Okay. So this this brings me back to something we, we speak uh, some time ago, I think. Uh, R, when you when you try to exit, it's always going to ask you if you want to save your work in a space. Um, and I, my recommendation is always say no because it, it saves in a, in a default file form, in a default file name called .rdata. And the reason for saying no is because then you, you stick with that. And if you want to remove that, you need to basically clean your environment and save that again or just delete that file. So instead of doing that, what I will do is save image and then specify where I save my image. And if I want to load that image back, I use load. But that's basically the same as using save for every single variable and function. Uh, when you do save image, it also saves your functions for every single variable and function that is defined in your session. Okay, but that's the same idea. Okay, and if you try to look at that file from a browser, it will tell you that it doesn't know how to open it because it's binary data. Okay, so that is what is happening under the scenes when you when ask when I ask you if you want to save your session. Okay, is saving your session or what is defining the session as binary data, which is good. What is not good is that by default it puts in this file and it opens it every time that you open it again. Right? So if you work in different projects, that may be a little bit of a headache. So let's talk about the RDS files. So the RDS files are similar to the R data file format with, with a couple of exceptions. It only says one single object at the time and the object is serialized during the saving, so that makes it slow down a little bit things. Um, and the object, when it's loaded, is directly assigned to a variable instead of relying on the previous variable name. Okay, so if I had a vector A from, with numbers 1 to 10, and I do save RDS, that's the name for uh, R data single object, uh, the variable name, and then my data.rds, then I say, when I read it, I, I say read RDS, the name of the file, and I had to assign it to a variable, and that's the variable that contains it. So it's a little bit less uh, structured in the sense that allow you to change the name of the variables, but you can only say one object at a time. And I think I saw a question popping up in the chat. Check. Uh, no, I will say don't do that. I will say don't do that. Don't, don't include, say, image. In, in your utility file, unless you want to do it, unless you want, so, okay, let me, let, me, let me go back a little bit. Unless you want to explore what you were doing at the moment of executing a particular script or function, you won't do save image in your utility file, okay? It could be useful if you want to catch a bug. So let's say that you are debugging a code, and you want to know what was going on there, or you want to say the state of memory, then you will do that. But what I will do personally is, and this is this could be a good point. So thank you, Jennifer, for bringing this up. So when you run in supercomputers, or, or you run in any computer, but you had to run for a very, very long time. And when I mean long time, it can be days, months. I, I, I had simulations running for three months, not all straight. So what you, what you want to do at some point is what we call checkpoint. And what a checkpoint does is at some point, so let's say every five hours or every six hours or every one day, you take the current state of your memory of the program and you save it. Why you will do that? Because if your simulation takes, as I say, a month long, 
and your simulation fails in the very last day of your simulation, you basically wasted almost a month of work, right? And you don't do you don't want to to be exposed to that. So, in in very long runs, when when you run for very long time, because you are analyzing data or you are simulating something, you may want to take these kind of pre precautions, right? You don't want to be wasting your whole month of simulation of of computing time, because at the end something fails. So eventually, or very periodically, let's say every five hours or six hours, depending how long your simulation, right? You may want to dump to save the whole state of memory. So you can recover from that and see what, what went wrong, do some forensics on what, why it failed, or, or basically continue your simulation. That, that's what I mean with a checkpoint thing. So in that case, you will use save image. But what I would do personally, I will have a function that checks for how long the, the program has been run and involve one of these algorithms, okay? Save image is a good one for saving the current state of affairs while the simulation is going or while the analysis is going. Okay? But I will put that in a function. I hope that makes sense. But it was a really good point. Thank you, Shane, for helping me that up. So the RDS, and, and let me know if there are other questions, the RDS says just one single object. So that can be useful if you have a very long array and you want to share it with someone else and, 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 and do something like that. That's the way to go. Now. I have this slide mostly for bioinformaticians. If you have some files, then you probably want to switch to BAM or better CRAM. Uh, this is provided by the RSAM tool package. If you have FASTA or FASTQ, BFQ are, are your friends. If you have data from peeling, uh, use BED instead of PET. So all these are the binary counterparts of, of these previous ones which are asked. Okay, and if you have other ones, there are probably versions of the binary ones. And in particular, in, in R, it's very easy. You load the data in ASCII or whatever was the original format, and then you save it in one of these R data or RDS file formats. And that will give you already a, a, an advantage point. Um, I have a couple more listed here. I don't know how many of you do bioinformatics, but because I want to move to the to the real uh, juicy part, I'm going to leave this for you to, to read. And if you have questions, again, feel free to, to ask me. By the way, if you're doing bioinformatics, bioconductor.org is probably the place where you want to check for packages and the latest trends, and they have really good tutorials as well. So good place to, to look at. Um, OK, let's talk a little bit about metadata. Okay, let me see if there are any questions. Chat, I think, is clean. Okay. Okay. So I think I, I answered your question, Jennifer. If not, please let me know. Um, so what is metadata? In, in a sim very simple manner, it's data about our data. And what I mean with this is, let's say that you receive data from the lab. So what can be metadata associated to that data? Well, the date in which you receive the data, how the data was generated, in which lab was run, under which conditions, which experiment. If you are simulating the data, what version of the code you use, who ran that, which parameters you use, anything, anything that can describe the process of obtaining this data. And I, I emphasize, I can't emphasize this enough. Nowadays, this is crucial information. All because this new umbrella that is under research called reproducibility of results. And that is crucial. Again, there are nowadays journals that just publish data. And of course, for publishing your data, you need to provide the metadata associated. So how, were, how was the data generated? Where did the data came from? How did you, or which program, or which version of the program, or which parameters you used to generate the data? And of course, all, all that is open. So it's about openness. It's about accessibility of the data. It's about reproducibility of the data. And not only the journals are asking for this, nowadays funding agencies, in particular in the States, Canada is moving into that as well, so at some point we'll, we'll catch up with this. But nowadays in the States, uh, NSF and, and other funding agencies is starting to ask to create repositories showing and, 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 and sharing all this information, all in terms of reproducibility and openness, at least in science, right? So all this is very crucial, very important, it's very bleeding edge at the same time. But many formats allow you to do that. So uh, the best binary formats have metadata baked already into the file format. And NetCDF is the case that we are going to see today or, or, or on Thursday, allow you to do that. Uh, so in this case, if you use this, the metadata and the data are never separated. 
if you want to put in another way, let's say that you're running experiments in, all the, in an old-fashioned way, you keep a lab notes where we basically take the notes of how you run the experiment, that's, that's basically the metadata, okay? Um, so I think I, I, I kind of, 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 of uh, basically give you a flavor of what metadata is. Um, it's kind of this, so you include your name, the author of the data, uh, the date and time when it was created or collected, uh, the code that you use, the version of the code, uh, if you have dependencies in what operating system, if it was a Linux machine, a Mac, or, or, or a Windows machine, uh, the variables that you use, so if you have a, a initial values for certain variables, if you're running models or ODEs, the parameters that you use for that, everything, as I say, everything that can lead you to reproduce the results that you are saving right there, okay? If you have something in mind and you're not sure, just include it, okay? It's going to be in binary format, so it's not going to be too, too heavy weighted, okay? Um, I think it's, this is just me hammering on, on, on what to, to include as metadata. Uh, but basically, I think I, 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 I was speaking uh, ahead of myself, so all what I mentioned is, is part of this, but you can come back and read these slides. It's basically all what I just mentioned, okay? So let me go to the specific file formats that allow you to do that. And as I mentioned, the hierarchical data format certifies a good one. NetCDF is a very common one. It's network common data format. And then there may be other specific ones depending on the discipline that you work with. But NetCDF is a really good, uh, a really good candidate because it's very, very homogeneous. What are the benefits? Most are provided by library or packages. They are self-describing, meaning that you can include metadata on them. They are binary agnostic. And this is a thing that is not so much important nowadays, but this is still a thing when you move from, from supercomputers, you may have different architectures, and the binary formats that one computer understands is not necessarily the same. These file formats basically avoid problems with that. When you're running things in parallel, we may have a, a lecture at the end of the course uh, about running things in parallel in R, you can have support for saving files in parallel, so even speeding up your performance a bit more. And in some cases, you have visualization tools already available depending on the, on the architecture and the operating system. So there are tools that allow you to, so that barrier that we say that they are not uh, understandable, human understandable, is not really true because you can have some tools, and I can show you in my terminal, for instance, I, you can have some tools um, that allow you to, to visualize. Or, or see what is inside a binary file, okay? So let's take a look at NetCDF. I, I was talking a little bit about it. It stands for Network Data Format. This is a clarification mostly for people working in, in, in forecast and weather. NASA has its own CDF format for this kind of things. It's not that format, although it's compatible. Uh, it's mostly for array-oriented scientific data. Okay, what it means is it's very good for storing arrays, vectors, or matrices. Uh, it's stored in binary form, uh, so it's very efficient. Um, it's very common in different, in different uh, disciplines. It's self-describing, um, and it has many, many APIs uh, in R, Python, C, C++, and basically any language, any modern language, has a library associated that allows you to read NetCDF files. So in other words, if you're going to save your data in NetCDF and you want to put in your web page or in the lab page or in your repository, anyone on the world will be able to access the data. So it's very open, even when it's not directly human readable, between quotation marks, it's, it's very open and accessible. Um, so how it works? So the idea here is that you're going to have variables uh, and these are going to be n-dimensional arrays. So remember we saw one-dimensional arrays, typical vectors, two-dimensional arrays, an example of these matrices, or three-dimensional arrays, like tensors, or multi-dimensional arrays. And then each of these dimensions can have different types. It can be a, a char, meaning a, a string, a byte, a short, in flow. These are just all different types of numbers. Now, the dimensions, this describes the access of the data, and we're going to see an example. And each dimension has a name and a length, and then there are attributes, basically nodes and information that basically go together with these dimensions. And you can see how, how beefy, how, how rich 
this this format is because I allow you to keep a lot of information, things like units. So I'm going to show you examples about this or notes that you take about the variable. So it's very rich in that regard. The attributes at the same time can be global or it can be specific to a given variable or dimension. Uh, it's a good place to stick your miscellaneous metadata and units, as I mentioned. Uh, so let me show you. So this is a schematic of how an etcdf file or, or the model, or model of the data looks like. So let's start with a binary data. So we will have some data. It can be, an, think about an array or a vector. That will have a type. It means it can be a vector of uh, words, like characters or, or text, or it can be numbers, right? So that could be a vector of numbers. That's the type. It will have a name associated to that. So that's how I'm going to name my variable. And then it will have dimensions. And I put two dimensions here to give the sense that it could be a matrix. It can be dimension one and dimension two. Okay? And this is just one option, right? One variable, let's say it's a matrix of floating point numbers or real numbers. It's a name. The type is numbers, dimension one and dimension two. Now I can give a name to the dimension, and the reason for that is because I can have multiple of these type of objects. So I can also give attributes, and attributes are description of this data. So this is my Hamiltonian matrix from, if you remember the example of the hydrogen atom uh, energy level computation, that can be my Hamiltonian matrix with dimension one and dimension two representing the different levels and the excitation levels, and this is just uh, numeric data, and that's my Hamiltonian matrix. Now, this is one single object within the file. Now, I can have multiple of these objects. So I can have my Hamiltonian matrix, my, my item vector matrix, uh, energy level matrix, whatever else you want to have. So these are single objects within the file. And then you can have file attributes as well. You can say, OK, what is the, who is the author of this, how that data was generated. And then you can have, if these things are common, so I like say like dimension one is the same for all the three options and dimension two is the same, then you can have all as common attributes to the to the file. Okay? So it looks like a very elaborated model for data, but because of that it's very flexible, it's very uh, robust, it's very uh, professional looking, I would say. Okay? Now there is a price to pay, of course, and is that we need to so it's not as easy as saying save RDS, the name of the variable and the file name. So you will need to specify, and I will show you an example how to do that, all these things. So that is where the, 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 the caveat comes into place, right? It's, it's no more of a caveat, but it's something to be aware. There is some extra work that has to be done in order to structure this, this data inside the file in this particular manner. But again, we are hitting the level of, of professionalism in, in data management here that if you're going to work in a top-notch level lab, people will be will be astonished by, by you dealing with this type of, of schematics and, and, and data formats. Okay? So I know it may be a little bit hard to digest at the first time. You get used to it, and I think it's, it's, it's a good idea to have at least look into this. Okay? I'm going to put this as part of the assignment, but I think it's going to be optional. Uh, so if you want to, if you feel like you would like to try this, you, you are more than welcome and you will be rewarded by that. Um, but I don't want so want to, to sweat too much about it, okay? At least you are aware and you have seen it and, and you more or less, I hope you are following and understanding what this is, okay? And then you have the file name. Now, we are almost running out of time. Uh, so let me just finish with this slide and I show you the code, how to implement this and maybe we can take, uh, maybe it's a good point for, for stopping so we can bring back the model, uh, uh, the last slide I saw for next class and, and then try the code with, with that in fresh in mind. Um, NetCDF has a lot of good features. In addition to the ones I mentioned, it allows you compression, chunking, which is breaks into pieces when you are saving in parallel I.O. Uh, is back compatible um, and it has a lot of other goodies. Okay, and actually the new uh, so the the HDFI is is built on top of NetCDF. So this is a good advantage of learning NetCDF because then HDFI builds on top of that. Um, one more thing, and I and I finish with this. I promise. Uh, 
I mentioned it's very, it's very easy to include units in NetCDF. And so there are conventions, so you can go to this URL and it will tell you which conventions you had to use for identifying units. So you can use, for instance, centimeters, and you can use CM as a abbreviation, or the British or American way of writing centimeter. So you can actually decorate a variable saying, okay, these units are in centimeters. So now that problem of, of conversions between different systems of units is, is basically curated, is basically fixed by including units in your variables. And I think that's, that's very, very interesting, okay? Um, so again, something to bear in mind, that's another of the GUIs. Okay, and I finish here. So next class, we're going to take from slide 42. I, I told you there was a lot of material in this in this uh, in this uh, series of slides, but I was I, I actually was surprised that we reached to this point. So next next lecture we're going to continue uh, looking at how to save files in NetCDF and how to read them back. Okay, and I think that's mostly what I'm going to do, and then we are going to start moving into uh, statistics. Okay, and so we will have enough material for assignment four. And I'm happy to take any questions if you guys have. I hope that it wasn't too much today. It was a very probably heavy uh, lecture, uh, but this is the, the really meaty, juicy part of it. So we are going to, to come back to the NetCDF uh, data file model next class and see the, the concrete example. Okay. Let me know if you guys have any, any questions about today's lectures or about the assignment happy to take any of those or about the exercises as well to check the chat and as usual i will i will stay uh, online for a few more minutes if you if you want to ask any other questions um probably i'm going to stop the streaming now so i'm going to see you again on thursday but again, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to write in the chat, okay?